situated just right. He says, you got to be just right. 917. Close, though. It is in 1 Samuel, and it's in the teens. We're in 1 Samuel 19. That's it. How many of y'all have ever seen the movie What About Bob? Oh, my goodness. I know. The, the sad thing is, is that you haven't. I mean, that's what's more staggering to me is when I say, have you seen this movie? No. Do you not get out much, people? There's more than just a Walmart. There is. Well, and this only makes sense to those of us who are cultured. Oh, ha, ha, ha. Miss Van's not here. <laughs> That's fine. I'm into I'm into regifting. <laughs> In the story, what about Bob? Richard Dreyfus and Bill Murray are patient and client. Richard Dreyfus is a psychologist, and Bob Bob has driven the past seven psychologists nuts because he comes attached to his counselor with his over-paranoia. And Richard Dreyfuss has had enough of Bob because Bob just simply will not go away. So he devises a plan. He calls it death therapy. And he says, death therapy? And he goes, yeah. And he says, Richard Dreyfuss is tying Bob up. He's putting bottles of gunpowder and gasoline cans underneath him because, you know, Bob, you simply will not go away. And I must get rid of you for my own sanity. He goes, well, what is this called? It's called death, death therapy. It's a guaranteed cure, Bob. Have you ever had somebody that you just can't get rid of? And you want them to go away? Saul has someone he's tried to get rid of. He can't seem to get them to go away. And as we looked at last week, we looked in chapter 18. You like that segue? Well, he blew up Richard Dreyfuss' house with a bomb. Yeah, if I blew it, you would never watch the movie, Delight. It's hilarious. Do you not like laughing? Are you sure? Well, I would watch the movie, you'd probably laugh. Yeah, I mean, but it's up to you. Okay, all right. You sure? Maybe you should guys give me a list of the movies you have watched, since it'll probably be short. <laughs> Huh? One million BC. You, you watch that one? It came out in 1939. <laughs> I'll look it up on Netflix. <laughs> you know, there there used to be there used to be TV sh programming where they would show movies like that repeatedly. No? No? Okay. You know, the Wheel of Fortune, you can only watch for so long before you they start repeating the words. But we digress greatly. He has tried to kill David. The first time he tries to, well, you look back. He tries to pin him to the wall with a spear. Not once. Not twice. Then he devises a plan. I'll have him marry my daughters. Not really. The goal is, what I'm going to do is have him go out and fight the Philistines for my daughter's hands, and hopefully the Philistines will kill him. And he tries that not once, but twice. And it fails miserably. And so at the end of 18, we pick up in verse 30, and then we're going to read into 19. Then the commanders of the Philistines came out to battle, and as, off as they came out, David had more success than all the servants of Saul so that his name was highly esteemed. This does not do much for Saul's psyche here. Saul doesn't like David because of Saul, David's success over Saul. So the fact that every time the Philistines come out, David beats the dog out of them more than any other servant of Saul is not helping David's cause here. So Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all of his servants that they should kill David. So now he's moved from, I'm going to murder Saul or David privately with my spear. And, and apparently, you know, he, he's not the best shot in the world because he tries twice. 
So then he moves to, well, I'll have him assassinated by working on my behalf and let the enemy kill him. And that way his blood isn't on my hands. To now, he's talking to his servants and say, we've got to kill David. So because it's not just my problem anymore, it's your problem. He's making you guys look like chumps. You guys, you guys look bad. This guy, when he, every time he goes out, he wins. I, I guess I could replace him, replace y'all with him, unless you want to keep your job kind of thing. And so, and, and pick up in verse 2. And Jonathan told David, Saul, my father, seeks to kill you. What? That's like someone telling you it's raining while you're in the rain. Therefore, be on your guard in the morning. Stay in a secret place and hide yourself. And I will go out <clears throat> and stand beside my father in a field where you are. And I will speak to my father about you. And if I learn anything, I will tell you. And Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant David, because he has not sinned against you. And because the deeds have brought good to you, for he took his life into his hand and struck down the Philistine. And the Lord worked great salvation for all of Israel. You saw it and you rejoiced. Why then would you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan. And Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. And Jonathan called to David, and Jonathan reported to him all these things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as before. Jonathan goes to his father, lays out David's case. Now, <clears throat> you've got to think for a minute there with Saul, this is not sitting well. David has now married your next to oldest daughter. He's now in your family. This really kind of sounds like a mob, a bad mob movie, Right? Right? We want to dock off Jimmy Two-Shoes, but we can't kill him openly, so we'll bring him into the family who have an accident. We'll all cry. It'll all be okay. Right? And then you always, if you watch these mob movies, there's always something like, hey, you can't kill this guy, man. He's, oh, he's golden, man. Oh, I won't kill him, I promise. Yeah, okay, those promises never work. Right? They just never work. You know, mob movies, delight? No. No. None of them? Not even The Godfather? You said, <laughs> Hallelujah, we've got one we both have seen. I do you this favor. Right? You remember that? No. No. Finally! We've had a major breakthrough on this pew here. So it's almost like counseling. I'm going to go home and feel energized. I'm going to write this in my diary. <laughs> David, you go and hide. I'm going to find out my father's intent. Now, what is Saul's problem with David? Saul's problem with David is that initially, when they return from war, Saul hears this little ditty. And it's probably been playing over in his head, over and over. Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. And Saul's anger has burned against David from that day on. The problem is Saul brought it on himself. Saul didn't go out and fight the giant. David did. Saul didn't wait for the prophet, for the sacrifice. He acted in the case of the prophet. Saul didn't do what God told him out of fear of the people. So Saul is in this place because of Saul's actions, and he's angry at the wrong man. Instead of being angry at himself for screwing things up, he's angry at David because he's showing him up. Now we all know, if you were all here, that David is the anointed king and will take Saul's place. So Jonathan goes out and reasons with his dad. Notice what Jonathan says. First of all, he speaks well of David. That's got to be great, right? 
You ever had an enemy and your best friend starts talking about how, what a great person they are? Do you, do you really want to just listen to that or punch your friend in the mouth? Oh, yeah? You think he's a great guy? Well, you know, you get some of this. You don't want to hear that. And so Saul listens to, Dave, to, to Jonathan and says, Hey, you're actually sinning against David. If you haven't figured out the two times you tried to scare him like a wild boar with your spear and then your conniving way of trying to get him killed by the Philistines, you're actually seeking to harm a man who's innocent, who's actually done you no harm. Now remember, we talked about this. You've got folks that when they have someone that's shining bright within their organization, instead of making that person the go-getter and the go-to guy and say, I'm going to give you everything you can handle, you run with it and we'll do great and glorious things, people get territorial and they get very defensive and I'm not going to be outshined by this young upstart whippersnapper. I've seen it in the Army. I've seen it in the business world. I've seen it all... When I was a machinist, we were told the story about Winchester rifles. I had two men, and they were twins, they were brothers. It's kind of like telling it's raining outside where you're raining, or Saul plans to kill you. No? 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 Where's Miss Van? She usually gets my jokes. The Masters. The Masters. I lost to the Master Singers. They were for Winchester Rifle Company. And. They were the tool manufacturers, and back at the time when they worked there, being a tooling guy means you were very skilled at making the jigs and everything Winchester used to make their weaponry. Well, Winchester decided they didn't need to pay these brothers a lot of money and decided that they would let them go and hire a new guy. Well, what these two twins did was they removed all the shims that they had put into the machines to keep them square. They took all their jigs and things like that back with them. And they packed it all up and went away. So when Winchester started making rifles with their new band of toolmen in, in, in there, they couldn't get anything to work right. And the guys were like, these machines are horrible. We can't do anything here. You're going to either have to buy new machines or hire these guys back. Well, they went and hired them back at double what they used to pay them. See, what happened was, instead of sharing their secrets when they left, they took their secrets with them so that they could be more valuable. And a lot of people, that's how they live their life. I'm not sharing anything that I know with anyone else because it's about me and I'm going to keep my value it is instead of training everyone around me to be the absolute best. You see it in the army, you see it in industry, you see it in churches, you see it in homes, you see it everywhere. People hold on to knowledge and power. Why? Because knowledge, if I, if I share this knowledge and power with you, then you'll have know what I know. We were teaching the Iraqis how to do a support battalion. And I'm going to flip to Taji with our SPO, and that's the support operations officer. And we're in a meeting, and the Iraqi S-4 is telling us why he will not issue computers to the Iraqi S-2, which is the supply officer for the Iraqis will not give the intelligence officer for the Iraqis a computer so he can get the information to keep them from getting killed. And he said, we said, we've given you computers for you to issue to us. No. No, 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 you don't understand. We've given you these computers for you to sign out to all these men to where they can do their job. No, I'm not doing it. Because if I give them a computer, then I will only have three. You don't even have four. They're not yours. No, they're mine. I signed for them. They're mine. If I give it out to this guy, then I only have three. And I give it out to this guy, I only have two. I have four. I have power. And going, yeah, but that guy's going to keep you from dying. So without him being able to get the information, you're a dead man. Doesn't matter. I have four computers. It, it, it's, it was this, I have it. I'm not sharing. Because I don't want, to be, I want people to look at me and look bad. Saul is in an image control. And David, every time it turns around, is shining brighter than Saul ever could in any of the aspects. And every time Saul tries to do something against David, what does the text say? Who gets scared and who grows in the Lord? Saul gets scared and David grows in the Lord. And so we pick up here, Jonathan is talking to him and he says, look... You are trying to harm an innocent man. And because of his deeds, 
He, uh, let me back up here to make sure I didn't skip a verse. Because he has not sinned against you and because of his deeds have brought good to you. David's actions are actually beneficial to you. You are a dominant power in the area when before you were like, I don't know, the Detroit Tigers. Or sorry, the Detroit Lions who got beat by the Vikings today. Or the Texans. Did you see that? I was like watching an adult whip a small child. Oh my gosh, that's painful. He's done nothing but good for you. For he took his life into his own hand and struck down the Philistine. The Philistine, not the Philistines. Goes back to whom? Who did he strike down? Goliath. He went out as a, as a young man who could not wear body armor, who could not lift your sword, who went out with a sling and some stones, hurled it, killed the giant, cut his head off, and you, Dad, were there rejoicing in what he had done because it benefited everyone and it put the fear of God into all the Philistines. And now you seek to kill this man because why? Well, because there's this little ditty the women sing. Saul has killed his thousands. Pride is running this train. Ego is running this train. Jealousy is running this train. All those traits right there have no good end when it's prideful over the fact someone else may have a better idea. Jealousy over the fact that someone is doing more than you. And it's so easy to do, right? You ever just watch a Facebook discussion from people? Man, people put the weirdest stuff on Facebook. I'm no, I'm, I, I, I mean, you know, I, I could put some stuff out there, but I have seen people put things on Facebook that I went and went, I don't think I ever, ever would have put that on Facebook. I don't think I ever would have said that in a public setting. Maybe in the car with the windows rolled up, but never on Facebook. He kills the Philistines. He put himself out there. Now, here's the thing. This is a bit of a backhanded comment, because who did not put himself out there? Saul is head and shoulders, according to the text. I believe it's uh, 1 Samuel chapter 9. Head and shoulders above all the men of Israel. He is a big man. He comes from the tribe of Benjamin, which is known to being fierce fighters. His dad was a mighty man of war. Saul was in his tent, content to pay someone else to go kill the giant. Content to let another man marry his daughter to go kill the giant. This young man has done nothing but good for you, and even the giant which you refused to go face went out and did it for you, and yet your response to this young man is, I wish to kill him, and I'm devising a plot to kill him. I'm looking for a way to kill him. Why? Because simply he's making me look bad. He's threatening the status quo here. He could be the person that surplants me because God has already said your sons will sit on the throne and your kingdom ends with you. He is a legitimate threat to the king's authority. And the Lord worked a great salvation for all of Israel. You saw it and you rejoiced. Why then do you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? What answer is the king going to give? Because that stupid ditty? Because those women sang a song that made me feel inferior? Because David goes out and everything he does, does well. And every time I went out and I took over the role of someone else. Remember the passage? I compelled myself... To do the sacrifice. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. But the people were what? They were fleeing. So I compelled myself to do it. I didn't want to not kill King Agag. I didn't want to keep the sheep. I didn't want to keep the goats. But the people insisted. Saul was looking for the response of what the people is. And David goes and does what the Lord asks. The difference between these two men is one follows God and one follows the crowd. And one should not be, and the king does not have to follow the crowd. He's the king, right? Last time I checked, you don't vote for kings. 
right? Let me stop. So Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan. Now this, I love this passage because it sounds like the hatchet's been buried and not in David's head. It sounds like things are going to be great and everything's going to return to normal. And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan and swore, as a used car salesman swears about the validity of the car, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. Jonathan calls to David and reports to him all these things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul's house. He was in the presence of, as before. And everything is happy for this sentence. Verse 8. And there was war again. And David went out and fought the Philistines and struck them with a great blow where a mighty slaughter. So that they fell before him. Then the Lord sent a harmful spirit and it came upon Saul. And he sat in his house with his spear in his hand. We've seen this play out before, right? This is like a repeat of a bad episode of Snapped. You ought to watch that delight. I mean, you really should. If you're not watching movies, that's a good show to watch, right? But I'd be worried, Clark. If you come home and there's plastic on the floor, call me. You've got a safe place to come to. He's got a spear in his hand, a harmful spirit is upon him. David is playing the liar. Not a liar, but a liar. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. And Saul sought to pin David to the wall. You could actually write in there again, because that's what he tried to do before. But he eluded Saul. And so he struck the spear, stuck the spear into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. I promise, I promise, David will live. I won't try to put David to death. I won't try to kill David. And then Saul, as he sits, and a harmful spirit comes before him, sits and he grips his spear in the rage and the anger and the jealousy and the pride all come back and he begins to feed and fester with all that in his heart. And the one person that is responsible for his downfall is the young boy playing the liar, right? No, the one person responsible for his downfall is the fact that Saul has a hard time following the commands of God. Evident by the fact that he takes an oath using the Lord's name, invokes the Lord's name in an oath, and the next verse later takes a spear and tries to skewer him again. You'd figure after the first two times, David would be wearing armor. But, you know, he comes back. This continues. We're going to look at it some next week. It continues where David eventually has to leave the presence of Saul. The life becomes so untenable. What happens? What has caused this? What is the thing we pull from this? Jealousy, pride, ego. These things are harmful. They're harmful at work. The person next to me got a pay increase and I did not. And they didn't do a good enough job. They don't do a job near as good as I do. I do a better job than they do. I'm owed it. And then we began to start to plot and think about things. And I've actually watched coworkers sabotage another coworker's work just to get even. We saw, I've seen this in the army. Well, this guy doesn't deserve that promotion. I'm a far better person than that guy. I'm better than that person was, and there's no reason why they should have got promoted, and I didn't. The person walks away angry, and they go away, and they are very upset, and everything they see about that person just enrages them more and more and more and more. Watch that on a football field. Listen to those high-priced talent run its mouth, and then when they poorly perform, is it ever their fault? We see it in all aspects of life, well, amongst family members, amongst churches, amongst businesses, amongst all aspects, politics. Oh my goodness, politics. Except that instead of spinning, pinning you to the wall, we just spin it until your career is over. David is an actual threat to Saul's 
throne. We know this for the fact that he has been anointed king. David is a threat to Saul's throne because David follows the Lord and Saul does not. But Saul has in a way in which he owes a great deal of this to his own downfall. As king, he sets the example and yet allowed the people to sway his vote not once but twice. As king, he had an obligation to go out and fight the nation's battle and lead the nation forward, and yet he chose not to. Why? Because before he was king, God went out and fought their battles. God was the one that went before Israel and took the battle to the enemy. The king was to do the same thing, and yet he did not. We see throughout the nature of Saul, his nature is not one of more morality or justice. We see later where David screws it up, sure. Pride, jealousy, anger, suspicion, wrath. These things poison the body. Poison the mind. And we will contemplate doing things to people who have never done us any real wrong because of a slight, a perceived slight, or because they're better at their task than I am. And we seek to do them harm simply because they've outshined us. Or, when we have individuals that outshine us, we flood them with the responsibility necessary because their sole purpose is to do you good. Their sole purpose is to continue to do things to where you benefit from them. Those are the two responses you have to an individual like David. Questions? Before we wrap it up. Okay. Let's close out with a word of prayer. You're going to get right on that snap, right, Delight? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for this opportunity to look at, again, this dynamic between Saul and David. It seems to be a constant repeating theme. The sad thing is, in lives of many believers, in lives of many church members, in lives of many Americans, in lives of many people around the world, this scenario plays out over and over and over. We may never actually pick up a spear and try to pin our adversary to the wall, but we use the term our adversary. We think ill will of a brother or sister. We plot and devise means by which we have power and others are not. We look at the success of others and cannot be joyful in the fact of their success because we did not receive, quote-unquote, the same level of success. And our jealousy takes over, and we seek to do them harm. And in reality, the only people we are hurting is ourselves. Heavenly Father, that you be with those of us who struggle with this concept and struggle in this area, and that we look at the means to utilize those who shine brightly as an opportunity to do us all great good, to focus in the area of developing talent, developing believers, developing those around us, instead of seeking to harm them. We'll see in the next subsequent chapters that this continues on. What a sad testimony it is for the first king of Israel to be such a petty man. Let us take from this and learn and internalize this in our own lives. We ask for these saints in your name we pray. Amen. All right.